Uh, our next speaker is Helen Löf, Associate Professor of History and Deputy Director of the Center for Police Related Science at Uppsala University. Her research area areas are national socialism, fascism, racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim, homophobia, hate crime, state and police response to extremism in a historical perspective. She has managed the Swedish Living History Forum and worked at the government offices. A part of her studies have been the wave of attacks on refugee, refugee camps in the early 1990s in Sweden, a history that is unfortunately repeating itself according to the latest news from Sweden. Her following presentation is called We are the Knights in White Armor, Self-Perception of White Supremacists as Protectors of Women. Helen Löv, was so good. Thank you very much, and it's a great honor to be here and to um, address this audience and return to my roots as um, uh, studying uh, of women's studies, I started my, uh, out my career as an assistant to uh, the, one of the first professors of women's st studies, Gunhild Schül. Anyway, when we look upon the word of white supremacy, we must be aware of that the core of the ideology is a perception that the world is ruled by a Jewish word conspiracy. Anti-Semitism is still the driving force within this milieu. And it's a milieu that is centered around various of small groups. But they are not in themselves the entire movement. Because what we are dealing with today is not only organizations. We are dealing with millions, with people who are bound together by a common ideology, by a common kind of set of beliefs. And they are very much today centered around activism, on the internet, of course. But the activism on the internet creates activism on a ground level. And, and it is in the symbiosis between what's organized and what's not organized that we today see the waves of attacks and the waves of violence picking up at, in a speech again. And I will return to that later in my speech. At first sight, these milieus, the white supremacy milieu and the milieu of anti-Muslim, so-called counter-jihadist groups, they look like women's issues are not something that they are deal, dealing with. We, don't, we normally uh, don't put them in, in, in that box, so to speak. But women, is, women are central for the construction of the ideology because they are the bearer of the future. They are the bearer of the future of the nation, the ethnicities, and the race, of course, when it comes to the groups that are believing in, in an existence of race. Therefore, to win women for the movement is of central importance. And also, of course, to control reproduction. Because the women, they are the bearer of reproduction. And it's always been one of the core things in these 
mind setting. It was for the old fascists and national socialists. The mobilization of the women for the cause. And how do they do that? They present themselves as the knights in white armor, the protector of women. If you look at the propaganda, if you look at the agitations from these groups, you see all the time the references to themselves as the knights in white armor. We are the ones who are protecting our women and children against aggression from foreign men, from Jews, from Muslims, blacks, and also, of course, from lesbianism and other things that are seen as a threat. And they are also, of course, saying that feminism has been portrayed by the cultural Marxists, the lesbians, and others. They have portrayed feminism. Because they say, we are feminists. We are the true feminists. Because we believe in equality between men and women. But they have different roles in society. They have different areas. They are equal, but different. And that idea has been portrayed by the Marxists, the feminists, the socialists, and so forth. And they also claim that society is not anymore in a position to protect women. against aggression from other males, foreign males, or for, for, for that extent also from aggression from males within their own community. It's commonly believed that, that they are in many ways Look, looking the other way around when it comes to domestic violence and so forth. It's not the case. There are a great deal of people who have been excluded from these milieus for that reason. They have not left these milieus. They have been excluded because they have been found out that they have been engaged in domestic violence, that they have been beating up their wives and girlfriends, and then they exclude them. Because they also have a kind of honorary ideal that you don't beat women. That's not manly to do. That, that's not something that is uh, a part of this idea of themselves as warriors. You don't attack women, particularly not your own women. And also, they, they have, for a great number of years, launched a lot of campaigns, campaigns directed uh, against the uh, rapes and so forth, anti-rapist campaigns in local communities, activists from this milieu, particularly from a group that is currently in Sweden going by the name of the Swedish resistance movement, which is also, by the way, a Nordic organization, which has branches in all the Nordic countries and has now formed the United no uh, Nordic uh, political organization called the Nordic Resistance Movement. That would be their political branch. The activist branch are different. What they have done for a number of years, they turned up uh, when, when there is a trial 
on the rape case. They turn out, they go to the court and they sit there supporting the victim, being there as supporting the victim. And that's very problematic to address. It's very problem, that's why we very seldom speak about these issues. Because it's very, very difficult to counter that in a propagandistic way or ideological way. Because how do you really do it? And also they are targeting different areas where they um, uh, stand around schools and so forth, and, and they are claiming that you are protecting the children against pedophiles, against aggression. And they are also very much engaged in the kind of uh, citizen guards, they are patrolling neighborhoods, claiming that we have to protect the women and children. We are the protectors of the women and children. And that is, of course, something that pays off. Because there is, of course, women also in these movements. The movements look male-dominated, but they are not. That there is a lot of women engaged, but they have a role backstage, so to, so to speak. You can see them when they have public demonstration, and that is something that creates a kind of internal uh, ambivalence, because the males, activists, they don't want them there, because they don't want them engaged in street fighting with polit political opponents. But the women, they still want to be there, so therefore they turned up anyway. But they are engaged very much in traditional female work. They are the ones who are running the organization, uh, having different kinds of activities to bring in money. And they are, of course, also engaged in all, all of these family activities they have, because these are not youth organizations. They are very much family-based organizations with a lot of family activities. But these, they, they are much more than just this. There is also collaboration, of course, between them and what we are seeing right now. Because what have, has happened with the communicational revolution is that was all of that talk that were previously in the neighborhoods against minorities, against refugee camps, has now moved out on the internet, which makes this process of growing hostility, growing talk about we have to do something about them, we have to get them out of here. That's what in the early wave, in the late 80s and early 90s, took place mouth to mouth, so to speak, in the local communities. That has now moved out on the internet and we see a symbiosis between what's organized and not organized. And when you look upon the rhetoric in the numerous of different groups, local groups, where uh, they have names like no refugee camps in XX city or no mosque in XX city or no, no thanks to uh, synagogues and so forth. You see that the idea of the knights in white armor is extremely present in these groups and expressed by people who has nothing to do with these extremist uh, milieus whatsoever. But they are still expressing the same kind of ideas. And that is that we have to protect the women in this community. 
We have to protect the children, the women. If there is, will be a mosque established here, we will have Sharia laws, and our women will be targeted by Muslim extremists. That is a very, very common thing that is expressed in these groups. And also that we have to protect them against the refugees. The worst thing you can be is a young male refugee. Because the hostility in this current refugee crisis is centered against young male refugees. And that is historical, that has historically always been so. We can see it from the um, anti-refugee rhetoric of the Second World War, the same kind of rhetoric. For instance, when the Scandinavian, the Norwegians, and the Danish refugees came to Sweden, not everyone was supportive. There was a lot of articles where people expressed fear, that they, they, they were feeling that this will be an insecure situation if we will have Norwegian refugees in our neighborhood or Danish ones, because they were young males. They could be criminals, they could be targeting Swedish women, attacking them, harassing them. And why were they not at home fighting? The same kind of rhetoric can be seen now to a very, very great extent. So being young and male is the worst thing you can be if you are a refugee. Because then all these stereotypes that they are not real refugees, that they are terrorists, they are really from the Islamic State, or they are criminals, rapists, is reproduced daily, constantly, that they are a threat to our women and children. Or that they are traders. Why are they not down there fighting? They have left their own women and children behind. They are not real men. They are cowards. That's also part of this rhetoric that we can see for the moment. And we can also see this wave of attacks and also wave of aggression directed against different groups for the moment. Of course, we don't know how many of these attacks that are really arsonists behind and the motives, but there is anyway indication that part of this, what we are seeing right now, is exactly the same kind of thing that we saw in the late 80s and early 90s. That's one of the waves, it's the attacks. And they are now also carried out against refugee centers where they have not uh, received any refugees yet. And the message seems to be a kind of the bur burning ground strategy, prevent them from even coming here because of the shortage of localities for refugee uh, reception for the moment. That's one of the waves that we are seeing. We are also seeing a wave of anti-Muslim feelings, of harassment, and a, and a wave of anti-Semitism, particularly in the south of Sweden. So there is a collaboration, or this, we saw the same kind of patterns in the 90s, the early 80s and the 90s, that this combination of 
uh, act, act, uh, increased activity from race ideological groups, anti-migration groups, combined with waves where, where the perpetrators are ordinary, not organized people. And we tend to see one thing at a time. Now we are addressing the refugee camps. Earlier on, we were talking about the aggression directed against poor European citizens, the beggar issue. Before that, we were talking about anti-Semitism, but they, are they had to be seen together. And in this rhetoric, in this uh, either if, or um, it doesn't matter if you are talking about the organized or the non-organized, one of the core thing is the idea, the perception of uh, of themselves as the knights in white armor. We are doing this to protect our women and children. We are not doing this out of hate. We are doing this out of love. That's what they are saying. We are doing this out of love, not out of hate. Thank you very much. <laughs>